Chapter 1. An Unexpected Departure My cell phone rings. It's Mr. Morad Khani, the press officer for the Islamic Republic of Iran's embassy in Paris. His Excellency the Ambassador would like to see you so that you can present him with a copy of your book. The news leaves me speechless. Nine years. It's been nine years now since I last set foot in Iran. As Tehran correspondent for the French, Swiss, and Canadian press from 2005 to 2007 under Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's ultra-conservative presidency, I had my Iranian press card revoked by the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance and was forced to leave the country in July 2007. Back under duress in France, I was greeted with open arms by my parents who, delighted and relieved, welcomed me back into their home and my own bedroom. Despite my chronic restlessness, I was more determined than ever to bear witness to the reality of Iran and took the time to write several books. Dantel et Chador, Lace and Chadors, published in 2009, traces the two years I spent in the Islamic Republic. While the book spares neither mullahs nor the Iranian people, it mixes laughter and tears and certainly gives readers a more human picture of Iran and, from the comments I've heard, a wild desire to go there. Flattered by the ambassador's invitation, despite his close relationship with Ahmadinejad, I agree to meet him and give him a copy of my book. It could be an opportunity to get closer to that country that I love so much, even, who knows, to set foot there again. But I'm still wary, because these are dark times for the Islamic Republic. In April 2009, the Iranian authorities jailed Roxana Sabari, an Iranian-American journalist, arrested while, like me, reporting from Iran. Accused of spying for the United States, the reporter likewise had her press card revoked and was sentenced to eight years in prison by the Revolutionary Tribunal of Tehran. She was freed a month later following intense negotiations between the two countries. Carried away by my ardor and hoping to project an air of naive sincerity, I allow myself a few thinly veiled criticisms. Look, Mr. Ambassador, I know that journalist, and she's anything but a spy. Roxana Sabari loves Iran, and the only thing she was doing in Tehran was her job. My interlocutor's thick brows knit. I push on. Iran is a wonderful country. Any French person would fall in love with it the minute they set foot there. I honestly don't understand why some people in the Islamic Republic are doing all they can to make sure the country is demonized. Visibly startled by the tone of my remarks, the diplomat looks at the cover of my book sitting on a low table in front of him. Two Iranian women, headscarves slipping off, are daring to dance a few steps at nightfall, an activity officially prohibited in the land of the mullahs. The ambassador shoots suddenly to his feet and spits. Mr. Arefi, being young and having dual nationality doesn't give you the right to piss all over the Islamic Republic this way. He seizes the book and throws it violently back down onto the table, leaving me speechless. I won't be seeing Iran again anytime soon. But seven years later, here I am, invited to the Iranian ambassador's elegant residence once again. Happily, another diplomat, Ali Ahani, more experienced and open-minded, has replaced the previous one. It's February 2016. The Iranian delegation to Paris is marking the 37th anniversary of the Islamic Republic with a grand celebration, and they've put on an amazing spread. The menu features fresh squeezed orange juice along with a succulent bagali polo bagoucht, rice with fava beans and dill accompanied by lamb. Numerous French and foreign diplomats are in attendance, along with a few rare politicians, including among their highest ranks, one Jean-Marie Le Pen, a regular visitor. Iran has changed its image. Since the election three years ago of President Hassan Rouhani, a conservative turned moderate, the land of the mullahs has ceased to be a source of fear for us here in France. Long ostracized by many of its fellow nations, the Islamic Republic, formerly part of George W. Bush's Axis of Evil, is described by the French press these days as a great country, home to a millennia-old civilization, and now making a comeback on the international stage. 
while the new chief executive's messages of peace have gone some way toward erasing the memory of ex-president Ahmadinejad's Holocaust-denying diatribes. Iran owes this PR transformation largely to the signing of the Iranian nuclear deal in 2015 between Tehran and the world's major powers, America, the United Kingdom, France, China, Russia, and Germany, putting an end to a 30-year-long crisis that was leading straight toward war. Iran is opening up, and they want the world to know it. Western journalists are once again authorized to enter the country. Business leaders are lining up to get their slice of the pie in this new El Dorado with its population of 80 million. But things are more complicated for people with dual French and Iranian nationality, and even more complicated for me. For three years now, I've been sending applications for press credentials to the Iranian embassy the way you toss bottles into the ocean, and despite my countless requests, I've never gotten a response. I don't think it's going to happen this time either, Mr. Saradinejad, the embassy's new press officer, tells me during the reception, though he has continually gone out of his way to help with my efforts to obtain this holy grail. Keep trying, he says. Inshallah, the end is near. I think you should go to Iran yourself, which you can do as an Iranian citizen, to try to further your case. And risk being arrested, Manu Militari, as soon as I step inside the airport? No thanks. Still, the diplomat advises me to get in touch with a semi-official Iranian agency to facilitate the process. For 20 years now, authorities in the Islamic Republic have insisted that foreign journalists, or those working for the foreign media, wishing to enter Iran, employ the services of agencies claiming to aid in their endeavors. For a minimum fee of 200 euros per day, these organizations, managed by former officials of the regime, will supposedly arrange interviews and provide journalists with a guide interpreter. These translators, who are paid next to nothing and are often young, open-minded, and ambitious Iranians are required to report the journalists' every word and slightest movement back to the authorities. With nothing to lose, I decide, despite everything, to contact one of these organizations directed by one Mr. Najati. Look, I'll do everything I can to get you accredited, says the gravelly voice of this former member of the Iranian security forces, who refuses at first to talk money over the phone. A few days later, he asks me to call him and informs me that he has personally obtained the precious open sesame for me. I can hardly believe it. How can one man in Tehran have more influence than an entire embassy? But to my astonishment, the Iranian embassy in Paris confirms the news, despite the loss of face. However, as it turns out, they're wholly unable to issue the correct permit themselves. Unlike journalists who are only French, I don't need a visa to travel to the Islamic Republic, because I already have an Iranian passport. To work in Iran, though, I need the same press accreditation as my colleagues, and unlike the visa, this isn't issued until you're actually there. So you don't have any official documentation proving that your permit's been granted, my father asks, nervously. I have an email from the embassy, I tell him, without admitting that this is no guarantee that nothing will happen to me once I'm there. As far as the Islamic authorities are concerned, I can only travel to Iran with my Iranian passport, which means that as soon as I set foot in the country, I'll be treated like any other citizen of the Islamic Republic. And because Tehran doesn't recognize dual nationality, my other country, France, won't be able to do a thing if I suffer some misfortune. But while this verbal agreement is certainly no green light, shouldn't it at least be considered a yellow one? And if I don't take this opportunity, will I ever get another chance? Mind buzzing with questions, I decide to throw caution to the wind and buy my ticket for Tehran.